Aloha, and welcome to The Creative Life, brought to you by the American Creativity Association in collaboration with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Darlene Boyd, and I'll be hosting today, and our co-host, Phyllis Blees, is with us. Phyllis help, joins me in welcoming our guest, Noelle Mecca-Linden. Noelle is joining us from Northern Ireland. To date, The Creative Life has taken our viewers on conversational interviews of renowned, sought-after researchers, practitioners, and consultants. Today, we shall dig deeper into the heart of creativity as we discuss how the arts may contribute in meeting the social emotional needs of creative individuals, and in particular, the creative artist. Let's get started, Noelle, by asking you to talk about the uniqueness of the social emotional needs of creative producers and why you often refer to yourself as a creative catalyst and compassion advocate, Noelle. Thank you very much, darling. It's lovely to be here. I suppose as an artist and a, and a, a creative advisor and mentor to many other artists, I feel really strongly that we need to really delve deep and support our own creativity. And often we can burn out or simply um, self-destruct if we don't invest in our own creativity. So for me, as a practicing artist, and as an arts activist, I know it's really, really important to be in the company of creative people, to inform myself about creativity, but also in order to sustain and nourish me, I need to take time to be creative and, and self-expressed. And particularly during this pandemic, if you like, I felt it's really, really necessary to invest in that. And because of that, I've become much more aware, aware of the need to be self-compassionate before I can be compassionate to others. Noel, let me just uh, begin and, and ask you to clarify, help me with something, and then I'll ask Phyllis, um, to, to chime in in talking with you. Um, I know sometimes we often confuse the concept of compassion with sympathy and empathy. They're all often um, tossed in with each other. Could you help us clarify the difference? I have some suspicions, but let's see, I'd, I'd like to hear what you, how you would uh, differentiate those three for us. Well, I suppose I'm, I'm a huge fan of Brené Brown and her, a conversations around the whole area of vulnerability and for me to, to share and show vulnerability is a sign of strength um, I think in terms of being compassionate and having empathy for others it's very very different from having sympathy mm -hmm. empathy suggests a sense of connection a sense of real understanding sympathy implies that you are not necessarily on the same level or indeed seen as an equal um, but rather someone who, who is making a judgment that perhaps you are stronger um, rather than, than vulnerable. So I think this idea of being compassionate and having empathy is something that we need to nourish and instill, you know, with, uh, from a very, very early age and, and, con and continue to actually invest in that and invest in opportunities to show our vulnerability in safe places. And I feel the arts have a huge role to play there, you know, in business, in eco economics, in cultural tourism, and simply living and living a fulfilled life. I think that, that really helps clarify. Um, as we move to empathy, uh, I know scientists will tell us that if you were truly empathetic, we almost mirror the neurons. If, if in fact, you slam your hand in a car door, uh, if we're being empathetic, we'll feel that pain. But then compassion really bumps us into a higher level. And I know that uh, as we talk about your personal challenges that we'll be dealing with compassion. So I, I really appreciate that you took the, you, your cl the clarity of your definition is en enhancing the concept of vulnerability is really important to me. And I know to Phyllis too. Phyllis. Yes, um, thank you, Noel and Darlene. And I'm thinking about the title of today's show, how creativity is a healing art. And as we talk about compassion and empathy, we, we, I know we're going to be talking about how you use creativity to transform however the pain is showing up into something that shifts us to healing and even flourishing. And that creativity is a medium by which we can move from the despair to the divine. And I wondered if you could share with us your personal story around that and then of course your craft how art was your creative medium uh, if you would okay well i have been very very fortunate to be to have been involved in arts for 
th almost 38 years. Um, I trained as an art and design teacher. I have taught in schools, colleges, universities, and in the prison sector. So I know firsthand how important creativity is. And to me, it's almost like a muscle. It's not necessarily a, a, a exclusively a tool, it's a way of being. And I'm a huge, huge follower of Sir Ken Robinson and was privileged to be um, awarded a, an individual award for uh, my, my services to creativity uh, from the work that Sir Ken Robinson did in, in Northern Ireland. So this idea of unlocking creativity and sharing creativity and nurturing creativity is really, really important. Um, I am the eldest of seven uh, children and I have been um, very much immersed in the, in the arts and the cultural life for many, many years, not just in my working life, but also in my voluntary work and also in my community um, commitment as well. And that's something that I've learned uh, you know, as a child and as a member of a very loving family. Unfortunately, like many families, we have been um, bereaved by suicide and um, I lost my first sister uh, 22 years ago, uh, Roisin. And it was just it was a, just a horrendous experience to lose a sibling at any stage in life is, is very, very difficult. But to lose a sister in, through sudden death is really, really, really uh, it, just hard to comprehend. And the weight of grief and the void that's left behind is, is unimaginable. I suppose my first role was to, as the eldest child, was to continue to support my parents and the rest of my family. But I also realized I needed to nurture myself. And because of that experience and being truly vulnerable and truly, you know, not in control of what the circumstances were, I had to, to seek support and also to invest in my own in my own self. And that wasn't about being selfish, it was about being self-compassionate. And I think it's only when we invest in self and we be compassionate towards others. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're pouring from an empty cup. For me, my, my creativity was really tested. And, and, and obviously my, uh, my ability to function as, as, a, a, as an adult, my work became, became so, so important to me because it was something that I was very driven about and it was a way to function, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't truly, I suppose, in touch with my feelings. And what I've learned on in, in, in reflection is really the importance of being still and being present to those feelings of loss and sadness and grief. And using the arts, whether it's music or dance or the visual or performing arts, they are really, I suppose, access to a way of being that recognizes and celebrates life as well as, as those that we've lost. And for me, I've given many, many um, talks and many, I've had many opportunities to share, I suppose, the learning for me. And what I choose to do is celebrate life rather than focus on ending life. I think if we can encourage young people older people, all generations, to invest in celebrating life, you know, as opposed to ending it. Using the arts is, is a really, really important way of doing that. The painting behind me is a painting called Little Blue, and I know that Eric has a, has a, a slide. And this is a painting that I painted one year on after we lost our first sister, Roisin. I'm no, well, how old, if I may ask, how old was your sister when this occurred? 36 years old, and her twin brother, Obviously, um, we, we all were devastated, but her twin brother's wife gave birth to a baby then uh, three days later. Mm. So this painting represents for me, I suppose, the birth and the, the loss and the love um, between a mother and a child, because the grief that my mother felt, as you can imagine, was just heartbreaking to witness. To, to have lost a child, you know, an adult, a child nonetheless, at whatever age is heartbreaking for parents. That's not the way or the logic of life. But for my, for my parents to watch them grieve, uh, it was just heartbreaking. And yet three days later, the birth of our, my nephew and my, my mother and father's grandchild was a very, very bittersweet experience as you can imagine. But because I come from a family that has, has huge faith and I suppose investment in, in, in ourselves as a family, we managed to get through that, but with a huge amount of, of um, personal family support. And so for me, this particular painting represents and symbolizes not just the importance of acknowledging love lost, but birth and rebirth and a sense of connection. And for me, the, the complementary colors, the oranges and the blues and the tones 
are very important. I come from a tiny little village on the shores of Loch Ness. I live in Enniskillen now, which is the only island town in the island of Ireland. So the waterways are very important and hence the reference to the mermaid. So this, this theme has been carried with me for many, many years in many of my exhibitions. So, so this idea of precious cargo, the cargo we carry inside us, the, the losses and the gains, the opportunities and the missed, I suppose, lives lost, um, for me, can be represented in very, very creative and beautiful ways. And while that was a heartbreaking time 22 years ago, when I had the exhibition, I called it Out of the Blue. And I wanted to play on words, play on the words of, you know, the, the, the colours, um, not through sadness, but through joy and celebrating new life. And my parents joined me for the exhibition up at Enniskillen, which was one year later after we lost Roshi and the birth of Niall, the little boy. And that's, that painting was one of the paintings in the exhibition. And it was the first night our parents were up in a, in a public event. It was the first time there were, there, were, there were huge tears of joy and laughter. And it was, it was very special. Very, very special. Noel. Thank you for that story and your journey and you're doing the painting at that time. Tell us about the process that, that you were doing that changed the process that you were being. Like, was, were you, did you feel it was a healing process in your body as you were creating the artwork? And then how did you feel when you completed it? Did it take you through your own journey? And by the time you were done with the art, did you feel that you had had a nice, kind of a cycle of completion of fulfilling your, your angst around the grief? Did you have some transformative feelings at the end of the art? Or has it been every time you show the art or look at it yourself? And those of us in the audience, maybe who aren't artists, maybe you're talking about using colors to represent how you feel. And is that, you know, give us some guidance about how your process might be one we could adopt. And Noel, if I could just ask, uh, didn't you share with me that you had a cancer diagnosis at this time? You were Yes, well actually what I what I haven't said was that we lost our sister 22 years ago, Roshin, when I painted this painting. And then um four years ago or five years ago I was diagnosed with cancer. I had cervical cancer, which is ironic in that I would be a mother hen I have no children, um, but I would be very maternal. And um, to lose, I suppose, the, 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 your being or the centre of creativity in terms of what is perceived uh, as a woman, um, my own creativity, I've, I've, I've focused on nurturing that. So I was very lucky and very fortunate. I had a history after my loss. I, I had my, my womb, obviously, and my ovaries removed. And, um, but then uh, uh, shortly, eight, eight weeks later, then we lost a second sister to suicide while she was in hospital. And that was just unimaginable. So for me, um, Phyllis and Darling, the whole idea of art, both, both the points that you made about my own personal creativity, the source of my creativity, the, 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 the potential of being a mother and, and losing that potential has been really, really important to me. And the point that you made, Phyllis, as well, about the making of the art, when I, when I was making that art, I probably was in the saddest time of my life. Um, it was a very, very sad time. I was returning to my own home here, which was about roughly two hours away from my parents after being with them for a number of weeks after we lost our sister. The funeral, the wake and all of that. And then to return back to my own home. And my marriage had ended around that time as well. So it was a really a period of great, great sadness. And yet, in that sadness and in that stillness, what I have created is a, is a thing of beauty, of a thing that gives me great solace to this day. And actually, throughout lockdown, the conversation that I've had, particularly to do with um, sudden death, I, I would be an arts activist, and I'm also a hope ambassador in terms of supporting opportunities for people who have faced adversity in the most challenging of times. And I've used this painting and so many more of my paintings to bring joy and to bring support and also to acknowledge, you know, the stillness and the sadness because you have to be with both. You know, you have to, you have to know what darkness is like, what darkness is like before you can experience the light. You need to know what grey is like before you can experience the colour. 
and you need to know what sadness is before you can experience the joy. So I consider myself very blessed and very, very fortunate that I am living a creative life, that I have access to the tools, to the experiences, to, to, the, to the, the losses and the gains, but most of all to the precious cargo that can be translated in the sadness and in the joy. And what, what I think is really important is that artists who inspired me and teachers and my parents and all of the guardians that I have been fortunate to have met have been a, a crucial part in this journey. And I remember one of the, the um, artists that I had as a, as a, a lecturer at college, P.P. Flanagan, he told me that a piece of art is never fully experienced until it's shown to someone else. So the artist as a creator is really, really important, whether it's poetry, song or dance. But when they share it with an audience, there is a different dialogue. There is a new synergy. There's a new experience that can be enjoyed time and time and time again. So that period of my life, while it's been very, very sad, and to create work in the stillness and the silence and the emptiness of my space provided me with the necessary, I suppose, ecosystem to start to build, to grow and develop and to nurture. And I suppose that's, that's when I became, I suppose, really aware of the importance of being self-compassionate first and then compassionate for others. It's very touching, Noel, as we listen to you and also as we, we look on the screen. Certainly when we first looked at your painting, uh, Little Blue, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And I'm looking at it above your head now and I'm looking at it on, on the slide to the side. Uh, her face is just lovely and the child. But as you continue to speak, that painting, I think Phyllis would agree, speaks to us more almost second by second as you go through your story. And I believe that's what you're trying to bring forth to us and to the viewers. And uh, I'm still looking. I'm still en enchanted by her. I'm still I, getting quite attached. How about you, Phyllis? <laughs> I, I am. I am. And, and what I'm, I'm really interested in for the audience and for ourselves is this creative process. So you, you could have read somebody else's work and poetry. You could have listened to somebody else. But what this art is, and we, I suppose we could do it with finger painting or our own mandalas or, you know, use a medium that we don't have to be great at, but you created something out of nothing. And that, that manifestation of that new medium, that new artwork, and it, or it could be, it could be a flower garden, but I, I'd never thought before of how creating something, so there's your creativity, is a ray of, of, taking the old and making processing your feelings and making something new and that journey is a, is a very thoughtful and impactful for, for thousands of people don't need anything special to use something to transform their own grief into healing and it comes to this to this door of creativity so have you walked other people through this process of transformation have you have you kind of taught this journey of creative healing yes i think i think i have and, and i wouldn't have i wouldn't have thought so until particularly um I've, I've got quite a bit of feedback and opportunities to speak and ironically quite a lot of it has been through this last you know the pandemic i mean i've spent 38 years invested in arts and creativity and culture and i would have i i, I would have and men continue to mentor artists and educators and you know students and teachers. And the old student that I had was an 83-year-old ex-Japanese prisoner of war who could see for himself the opportunities in creating and making. I used to be a lecturer in one of the local colleges here, and I, I ran a lot of evening classes as well as during the day. And what I found were lots of people who at the time in my naivety, I was about 20 or 29, I thought they were old, but really, I mean, I, I would be 60 in December, so I'm only still a young thing. And the reality is that there were people who were coming to the, um, the, the classes, the recreational art classes, for the sheer joy of reconnecting with people. And this idea of being part of something, being part of a community, being part of something that, that they could return to, 
And this particular gentleman, Harry, was just a lovely example of somebody who flourished and, and grew into a completely different um, evolved uh, 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 human being that was loving and compassionate, but most of all, compassionate towards himself. He had lost his wife um, as well. Um, uh, she had died, sadly. And um, so, he, so the companionship was very important as well. And arts and creativity is one of those things. It is contagious. The joy that we feel. And I, I'm on, I'm on a, a mission to make creativity the antidote to COVID. I'm on a mission to encourage people to really embrace their own creativity, whether it's music or dance or gardening or just reading. Or, or, or poetry or spoken word, there is such potential. And I think all too often, many, many adults have been scarred because of the, ex the poor experiences they've had in school. Many of us had great, great experiences, but not everybody. We can remember those champions that we have had in the school context or in the playground or in school, but we can also remember those that have been maybe not so kind or not so compassionate. So I think we have to we have to look differently at our educators. They're not confined within school settings. They're they're lifelong learners, and I think we have to embrace that. And I know for one that I continue to learn. I continue to embrace opportunities to be creative. And I know for a fact that I if I hadn't access to you know creativity or to those that are creative around me, that I would find it very very difficult, very very difficult. So if I may just to follow on what I've gotten now from that answer is that, that it, there's three, it, at least three stages to this process. One is to just reach out and create something. And then you talked about the magic of sharing it, that it takes on a new life and that, you, you, and I, I'm not very artistic. So um, I trust that what you're saying is that you said we you can't imagine how it feels to share your music or share your painting. So there's a sharing of it. And then you talked about this community so that it's a social thing. So you talked about when you're going through grief, you might be isolating. But if you can get into the community that shares your joy of that particular art, you're actually putting yourself into a non-isolating setting in the creating of it and the sharing of it. So you've got the creating of it then sharing your art and then doing it with others. So, mm -hmm. you know, Darlene, you may have other um, takeaways from what she's saying, but I mean, there, there are several stages there I think we can all learn from. I think that, uh, I think Noelle's reference to isolation is an important one for all of us. And Noelle, as you, as you take us back to the, the months that we have spent, I'm, I doubt that there's anyone that hasn't experienced, at least for some period of time, that feeling of isolation, isolation away from our families, that we couldn't visit, isolation from the colleagues that we have. Uh, we compensate in many ways by, we're talking on Zoom, but we compensated during COVID by actually getting, getting our socialization and our, our support networks in different ways. Uh, but I've been very impressed by your efforts, Noel, as you say, to, to be there for others in your community, in the sense, not, not just giving back because someone was there for you, but having it truly in your heart to want to do good. And with that in mind, as, as we're, we're coming up uh, almost on the conclusion of our conversation, can, may I just take you back to your award from Sir Ken Robinson? Because you, you mentioned that that award was given to you because of your efforts in education. So I think it, it would be interesting to hear what, I mean, we think we know what he saw in you, but it'd be nice to hear it from you as well. And the we to mention to the viewers that Sir Ken has passed not too long ago, so he's no longer with us. So in a sense, it would be somewhat of a, a tribute to uh, bring our session to conclusion with you talking about that award, what it meant to you. Absolutely, darling. It's easily the, the, the most important award I've ever won. There is a, there is a connection. I don't with this know painting. about that, but... <laughs> there, is, there is a connection to this painting as well, because a year, um, just to, um, around that time that we lost our sister Roisin and, and my marriage had ended, I was at a conference and um, I'd heard Ken Robinson speak. And I was totally blown away by him. 
and they had a document um, called All Our Futures that was really re-evaluating the importance of creativity and education and for all our futures, the economy, for cultural tourism, for our well-being, for our mental health, all of those areas. And I then, um, we had a very proactive um, permanent secretary for culture, arts and leisure, who incidentally is a good friend of Susan McCalmont, who is who's our mutual friend as well. And the irony of the whole thing is that um, she then, on the basis of the conversation that I had with her and the document that I that I gave her, invited Sir Ken Robinson over to Northern Ireland to help us um, with unlocking creativity agenda, which was to unlock the potential of people and place across Northern Ireland, the economic regeneration, the, to support the political, I suppose, um, balance as well, and bring you know the, the idea of supporting peacemaking here. But the the reality was that. There were many of the initiatives that came out of that strategy that Sir Ken Robinson supported, including then subsequently then the, the opportunity for the Dairy London Dairy UK City of Culture bid, which I was part of. But at the time that I met Sir Ken Robinson and that he came to Northern Ireland. Just a few minutes left, Noel. So yeah, he was writing his book um, Out of Our Minds. And I had I had dedicated to them that I would do my exhibition out of the blue. So the year that he did his um his launched his book and I had my exhibition was the beginning I suppose of a decade if not more of um developing the connections with Sir Ken Robinson and also the, my investment in my own creativity and supporting the creativity of others and that has been a huge huge for me a huge opportunity that I'm indebted to the Robinson family for. No, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Share, thank you for being, opening up your heart and soul to talk to us about uh, how, how we can be more compassionate to others. And hopefully, if we're ever in any close situation that we know that um, folks that we can turn to, and I have to say, Noel, from our conversations offline, I know that uh, Phyllis and I, if we know we can turn to you at 10 times and we've just we've just met you so it's it's our pleasure we're very grateful to have had you with us today and uh, with that i'll just let our viewers know you have been watching the creative life on think tech hawaii with award-winning artist and compassion advocate noelle mccallenden so please plan to join phyllis blees and myself in two weeks as we continue the journey of living the creative life and thank you both, Phyllis and Noel, and um, aloha.